Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Well, it's time for our hot topic, and this is to look at Nigeria's minimum wage, the impact and analysis on all that has been happening. Now, the industrial action has affected businesses and critical services across the country, including schools, hospitals, and power supply as workers complied with the Trade Union Congress, CEC, and Nigeria Labor Congress, NLC order. The federal government said the 494,000 naira new minimum wage proposed by the organized labor could cripple Nigeria's economy. The minister lamented that the 494,000 naira minimum wage demand would amount to a 9.5 trillion naira expenditure burden to the government. According to him, they had agreed to increase the country's minimum wage by 100% to 60,000 naira from 30,000 naira in line with the current economic realities. Now, joining us to have a conversation about this is Peter Isile, is a former TUC and Pengasan president. Good morning, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Mm. All right. So we also have Frank Elianya. He's an economic analyst and is a company analyst at Tech Cabal. Good morning, Frank. Thank you for joining us as well. Good morning, and thank you for having me too. Mm. All right. Okay, so let's start with um, Peter. I mean, you are the former president um, of TUC and also Pengasa as well. Let's just ask, what's the latest with all that has been happening? Because we've known that the Labour have threatened to go on strike, which they did yesterday. But there's some form of conversation they're trying to have with the government to finally reach an agreement. So what's the latest? Yes, I think they, they had a meeting yesterday. So uh, the meeting was fruitful and... Uh, that the president made a commitment to that the federal government made a commitment to go above the sixty thousand naira. While labor will go back and then talk to the various organs, labor is expected to summon the national executive council to look at uh, what the federal government is bringing to the table. The first thing is to have that commitment that uh, the federal government is going to go above what was agreed. The federal government is going to go above what was agreed, and then they can have a conversation. So. What hopefully when the National Executive Council of both NSC and TUC meets later today, then that will determine the next phase. I'm just trying, I'm just curious. Let me stay with you before we go to Frank. I'm just curious uh, the thinking of uh, a TUC, like uh, when it comes to matters of uh, remuneration and all that, uh, what always crosses the minds of TUC chieftains, TUC NLC chieftains? Like, why? What do you demand apart from the fact that okay, it is it is uh, just salary increment and all that? What are some of the worrisome things that are always brought to the table when you are doing an agitation like this? I, I think one of the challenges that uh, Labour is currently facing is. Uh, lack of trust uh, over the years. It's not just about the Tunisia administration. The Tunisia administration is just about a year old. So you have eight years of Buhari, you have the one before Buhari, and you find out that certain things government should have done, government is not doing. So what you have Labour talk about is cash, cash, cash. Ordinarily, it shouldn't be cash, 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 because the expectation is if you pay 400000 today, you are going to have a galloping inflation and what have you. But labor is doing all of that because labor just feed that in terms of education, nobody cares. In terms of healthcare, nobody cares. In terms of transportation, nobody cares. And you and I know that the cost of transportation right now is what is taking about 60 to 70 percent of uh, salaries. Yeah. So workers actually want, the chieftains actually want an opportunity to bring other things to the table. So it's the responsibility of the government to say, okay, we don't want to pay this amount of money. I think uh, in your opening statement, you made reference to the fact that government says uh, it's going to balloon over $9 trillion. Mm. But if you know that is what is going to happen, why don't you all the while make a plan to take away those heavy lifting that workers are complaining about? We've always been saying yeah. that. Well, why, what are they bringing to the table at, at these negotiations? Are they just saying they're going yeah. to add money? Or they're saying, okay, the reasons for the hardship in the country will be, uh, will be dealt with? Yeah. Uh, but, Basically but, to look at the root cause of mm -hmm. the matter. Because if you're even saying, um, if you look at the healthcare sector, there is nothing being done, education, nothing being done. Isn't this where labor is supposed to be agitating for those things to be done to ensure that we have better welfare aside the money in hand? Of course, Labour do that. Labour always talk about it. You and I know that this current government is talking about CNG vehicles. Yes. 
that were that was part of Labour's proposal, even from the previous administration, which this administration took on board. If you look at Labour's 22 points demand, they talk about CNG vehicles. They talk about providing uh, affordable transport system to make it easier for workers. I think I think the the major fulcrum here is transportation, but where our attention is always at is when you start hearing Labour talk about. Cash, cash, cash. No, it's not only about cash. If you look at their 22 points demand that they made to the to President Tinubu, it's all stated there: healthcare, education, and then uh, transportation. Transportation is uh, one of their major trust. Mm. Okay, so let's move over to Frank. To Frank yeah. um, you're an economic analyst, and Labour made certain demands. In fact, um, the first demand they made was because of the inflation, hyperinflation in Nigeria, we expect that workers' salary should be increased to 1 million naira. Then it came down to 615, and as of today, it, starts, it stands at 494,000 naira. Do you think this is unrealistic coming from an economic point of view? <coughs> Oh yeah. So um, from looking at it on paper, it is it is unrealistic because the first thing you're going to ask yourself is where's the money going to come from? Yeah. Um, the 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 government has made a budget of about uh, 28 trillion, and uh, it, it's it's likely going to borrow that money. And then uh, um, along the line, we have seen uh, some projects uh, being. Um, um, proposed and uh, for instance the coastal road is um, mm -hmm. going to cost a lot of um, trillions of, of uh, naira and that money also is going to be borrowed so there's a lot more plan to borrow um, for, uh, as in to fund projects and to do other things that government want to do now if you come with a wage um, um, request that is uh, um, like 200 percent higher what the government used to pay before um the the concern becomes um is this sustainable if, mm. if even if they decide to pay for this year uh maybe borrow money which of course they're going to do to um to do that um would they do that next year then secondly is that um aside from the federal government the state's government um, several of them are even struggling to pay the 30,000 naira um, that was proposed um, previously. Many of them are still paying on, um, below 30,000 naira, mm -hmm. you know. And now if you come with a, um, a, a, a wage proposal, say 60,000 to 100,000 naira, now they said that 460, you know, um, the, the resolution they reached is that... Uh, um, it's going to be something above 60,000. You know, if it's going to be um, easy for the federal government, the question is, is, will it be easy for the state government to pay? And then there's also the concern that the private sector are going to be pressured to pay this money because what you're talking about here is uh, uh, um, the cleaners in their offices. You've got the... Uh, um, the vendors, you know, small guys in the office that the ones are going to get this this money. But um, it will also um, reflect in the wages of other people who are above them. Because, I mean, if you're paying um, least at 60000 others, um, the salary you pay others will have to increase as well. So the wage bill of companies are going to increase. Um, the wage bill of the state government are going to increase. And, of course, um, the federal government... It's already um, has a plan of uh, borrowing, so, uh, and, um, and they're going to increase the wage bill that they have currently. Is, um, is this so on paper or is practical, is the, Mr. Elanya? What is it in practice yeah. or, or just on paper? Because when you talk about um, private sector also doing what the federal government has accepted to do, is it happening now? Because there are some people who are still not paying 30% uh, minimum wage, and nothing is being done about it. Uh, do you think that once they raise it, it will automatically translate into the private sector? Because those who are paying are already paying higher. Those who are not paying, I'm not sure they are all any, go, going to do anything about it. And nobody seems to cover those category of workers that are not covered by NLC, as it were. Mm. Th those are a function of uh, implementation. Um, if the government, um, if we had a, a, um, a sane a sane government 
um, that goes ahead to implement what it has uh, um, agreed, those things will not be an issue. In, in other countries, say in South Africa, if the government says the minimum wage has been increased to um, maybe from, take for instance, say uh, ten, uh, from 10 rands to 20 rands, you know, every company um, has to, you know, align immediately. Um, if you're not aligning, it means that the, um, the workers in that company can actually um, petition and the government uh, or the company will be sanctioned. But here it isn't like that because the implementation is very lax, you know, so the government, um, the federal government does what it does and then the state government can decide, well, we don't have the money, so um, we're not going to pay, which is what we have been um, struggling with um, over, over the years. And that's also why the, um, if, if the state government isn't paying it, um, companies can as well say, man, we can negotiate with you. Uh, we can give you something a little bit higher from what you were earning before, but we can't pay you what the government is proposing. You know, so it's a, it's a function of implementation. You know, um, if, if, if it is strictly implemented, it means that everybody's wage bill has been, um, has been affected. Um, immediately. So that's where I see it. Mm. Okay, so Peter, um, I know that there are certain indices that made us um, or that made the NLC and TUC reach this figure, uh, which started from 1 million to 615 and now 494. If we're looking at, you know, inflation, right, and we expect that income should be increased as per how inflation goes shouldn't we now move to a year-on-year -year basis in the sense that um for every time there is an inflation for instance if there's a two percent inflation then my income should be increased as well do we always have to wait for that to expire in five years before we start to look at another um minimum wage figure no we are not we're not supposed to we're not supposed to wait but one other thing, just like what uh, Frank alluded to, is that when I was Pengasi president, majorly I deal with those, those in the private sector. So majorly, we just have few companies like NMPC that is more uh, the one that is government. But all others in the, is from the private sector. And the challenge you face in all of this is that in, in Nigeria, we are the one that don't really care. We don't care about implementation. And that has to do with the government. What I discovered was that the private sector, majorly, you will have less of a problem dealing with them than dealing with uh, 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 the, the public sector. Because government just don't follow the rules. So what you have is that minimum wage is a benchmark. That is the least you can pay. The minimum wage is, is, not, is not static. Once you make it a benchmark, then you can pay hundred and something thousand. There are a lot of people in the organized private sector that are not that are not within that benchmark. I can tell you that you will not have any member of TUC that that is earning anything less than that will be any anything less than a hundred thousand. Even as we are talking about minimum wage, right? I don't think they even any that will be any that. Mm. Even as we are talking about minimum wage now, and there are also some organized private sector who happens to be collateral damage as a result of this strike, who have even gone ahead from when they did the Naira float, from when you do the subsidy remover, who have also gone ahead to cushion the effect on their workers. Yeah. You made reference to those in the informal sector. Let me give you an example of someone that I know whose, whose workers are, no, are in the informal sector. He has a driver. And now he pays the driver 80,000 Naira. Then he gives the driver, that's the cash. Now, I'm looking at the other addictives that makes it very interesting for the driver, which, of course, is what I think government should be thinking of doing, is that he give, the driver has accommodation. Mm. He provides accommodation for, for the driver. Then, after providing accommodation for the driver, he also ensures that the driver does not have any need for transport challenges. Mm. So, and then the driver is entitled to two meals a day. So, let's just say, uh, for the sake of... Uh, what we are talking about let's say two meals a day comes to about two thousand naira every day so the two meals a day times 24 days in the month comes to forty eight thousand. Mm. then he, he gives him a room a self-contained apartment for him to live and let's assume that is twenty five thousand naira but from where i know this guy lives you can't pay twenty five thousand naira for a self-contained apartment mm. but let's for sake of this argument let's say twenty five thousand naira so you have forty eight thousand plus 25, which is 63, plus 80,000 Naira, which is 143,000 Naira, is what the driver is earning. Mm. 
So what is taxable is the 70 or 80,000 naira. The other things that comes around around are not taxable, but they are also cushioning whatever effect that the economy will have on the driver. Are you going to tell me that driver is going to block the road and say the bus will not go out? No. So the, 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 what we expect our government to do is to think outside of the box. Okay, if we can't pay you 400,000 naira, there are areas you can, you can even pay up to 300,000 naira, not cash. There are incentives that you can put in place. Example, transportation. If I know that, okay, my transportation out of my salary, government is now reducing it by as high as 40%, it's down by 40%. And then my health care, if you know what it is to treat a ma malaria, just say malaria used to be 3,500 to 4,500. Mm -hmm. Now, to treat malaria for a child, you are looking at about nothing less than ten to 12,000 naira. When you have all of these challenges, government need to look at the areas they can, they, can, they can lessen the burden on the ordinary Nigerians. It's not just the workers, because NSC and TUC, they have less than 10% of the workforce. So they can always use the platform to fight for themselves. But we need to do it in such a way that even the ordinary man who has no access to, who is not being unionized, who has no platform, can also be a beneficiary. That's why sometimes you see the TUC coming up, supporting the NSC, and the NSC going on this hog. It's not really only about themselves. It's how they think that this whole thing can cascade down for everybody to benefit. Hmm. I mean, I know something we've always said on the show is it doesn't matter what the wage, what the minimum wage figure is, even mm -hmm. if it's only fifteen thousand naira that I get, as long as I have every other need yeah. met, um, that's fine. Because with the, pic the the picture that you've painted right now, you know that the driver can as well save you know whatever he's getting as cash but other things because yes. these are needs that he has they are met he has housing there's no need for transportation he has feeding the basic things that you need to survive is already met so we're definitely not going he to will use salary for a job and uh, <laughs> that's the thing. yes he will use it yes, for a job he can, and he can, he can do something with... nice but i don't know let's go into specific specifics um, i'll still stay with you mr sl um all this is happening because of a matter of it's a matter of policy, and policy is affecting a lot of other um, a lot of people. That's why we are we are where we are right now. Let's specifically see what these policies of the new administration, the present administration, has had on, say, Pengerson as a body. If you say if you say for Pengerson, if, if I'm to look at the totality of the policy, which of course has to do with the oil and gas. I think this administration is doing well in terms of that because there are new investments coming into that sector. And then there is, a, I think I did an interview with another TV station and they asked me to score in terms of policy the oil and gas in the last one year of this administration. And I said for effort, I will give them a B. Then for result, for result I'll give them a C. So why am I saying all of that? You are having you are having more investment coming to that sector. That's one. You are having local players being encouraged to play in that sector. You have uh, uh, Exxon Mobil now divesting, and you have Seplat, which is which is an indigenous company taking over the Exxon Mobil asset. I am a believer that we should encourage local investment, which will encourage Nigerians to be big time players in that sector. Because if you do that, you are not going to have an example a Frank and Sons. Where in the oil and gas and having a fifty million dollars. You had to use Frank. You had to use Frank. You had to use Frank. But uh, I'm trying to understand. You're having the guy run away from Nigeria. Mr. Sell, I'm trying to understand this because on the Punch newspaper this morning, uh, Dangote is quoted as saying that the IOCs are not selling crude to his refinery. So if yes. investors are coming and local players are being encouraged to play in that sector, uh, how? Why is this happening? What is going on? What is wrong? First of all, you have what they call forward sales. So forward sales is that the previous government borrowed so much cash, and what they do is that the way they can pay, you can pay your collateral, you use your crude, let me use the word crude oil as your collateral. So let's take, for example, we borrowed about $3 billion, I think it's about $3 billion or $2 billion from Exim Bank. And then the agreement is that we'll give Exim Bank 90,000 barriers every day. So, what you have done, you have you have already mortgaged that ninety thousand barriers every day. So, what you have is that contract have been signed over the years. So, that got coming in is also a failure of planning from our government. So, what they are trying to do now is ramp up production, 
Dangote is not getting his school there from outside of the country. But I think in the long run, maybe in another one year, they will, they will be able to resolve those Titney issues. But the borrowing that we have been borrowing in the last eight years, the only way we can get those money or can be able to borrow that amount of money is that it, we do what the call forward says or a sizable portion of our crude oil daily production is being used to pay off those debts. Sounds like our future has been sold already. Mud gauge. <laughs> yeah, mud gauge, you know. Mud gauge is I the word, know. yeah. Um, okay, so Frank, let's talk about, you know, the, the figure, the, where the um, NLC and TUC stand right now. And in fact, when they were looking at this, the moment they arrived at 615, they had a big a breakdown and the breakdown says um you know about 270,000 naira um for 30 days was benchmarked for food um and and 10,000 naira for transportation and let's say this is like a family of four thereabouts so i don't even know if 270,000 naira is okay for food <laughs> right now because if you go to the market it's a different story that's there. Um, others are electricity and power which is about 20,000 naira i don't know if that can you know that's okay for a month accommodation is at forty thousand naira i don't know where that person is going to live definitely not maybe here on the island in lagos maybe outskirts or ogun state um utility which is water <laughs> about ten thousand naira gas or kerosene is thirty five thousand naira clothing is twenty thousand naira education is fifty thousand naira um maybe that's for one child sanitation ten thousand naira i don't know what law is taking right now um, medicals is at 50,000 naira, resulting to a total sum of 615. So that was when they were still at that figure. Now it stands at six, at 494,000 naira. If we're looking at, you know, the lives, the standard of living for Nigerians, I know we might say, you know, this figure that we're calling is a little bit unrealistic, but don't you think it's high time that the government looks at, you know, where people are right now, um, their economic reality and say, okay, let's have a substantial figure. That figure might not be 494,000 naira, but it's something that is substantial that people can have their needs met. Don't you think the government's response um, to the demands of the NLC and TUC should be better? You are you're absolutely right about that. Um, the government's response uh, being a lot better than what it is. You know, um, uh, I was listening to uh, Minister of Finance Wale do the other day, mm -hmm. and of all the things that he said, um, the only thing that that resonated was that the government uh, was at a loss uh, at what to do to reduce uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, and no matter how much you pay or you agree to pay these guys, um, if you don't ag address the issue of inflation or getting the economy into um, hyper productivity, um, we will return back here, say, in December, latest. Mm. You know, it's not a prediction, it's a surety because. The inflation will continue to rise. We're already at 33.6 percent in uh, as, as as April, all right. So I don't know what the numbers in May are going to look like. I don't know what the numbers in June are going to look like. But uh, from where I stand, it doesn't look good. As at yesterday, the um, the exchange rate exchange rate was at uh, 1,400 um, slightly above 1,400 naira, you know, and at so long as companies aren't productive so long as we keep waking up to news about companies leaving um yesterday kimberly clark uh the makers of a hoggies uh sacked about 90 percent of their workers you know um in preparation of their ex exit from nigeria where however you want to look at that that the optics are wrong you know and then um, we get the news that, that Total Energies, you know, takes, um, that, that have been in the country for a long time, you know, decides to do a project, a major project of about six, $6 billion and is looking outside the country, you know. Uh, those doesn't look good. What we need to address as a matter of urgency is the product the production level of our manufacturing sector it, it, until those guys are back at work 
doing what they are supposed to be doing, you know, being productive until we address issues in the health sector, you know, work, um, workers living in droves, you know, um, com um, compounding the issues, the pressures that that sector is facing right now. Until we address issues in education, until we address issues more, most especially in agriculture, security, most importantly. If we don't address security to ensure that our farmers go back to the farms, of course, food inflation will continue to rise because um, farmers can go to farms where their lives are at danger, where they have to pay a lot of money to do harvesting, to harvest the crops that they planted. You know, so they can't keep doing that. And then we expect things to change. You know, so the demands that the N N NLC is making is as a result of the failure of the government to address the basics, which is get the economy back to productive, to productive levels, get um, the reduced inflation and over time, we have seen here and there some form of movement from the CBN and from other agencies trying to, you know, um, um, clamp down some people who are doing the, uh, forex and all of that. Uh, those are just not what. You, those are not the things that are going to address these things as for a long time. You need the physical aspect of this economy functioning at the maximum you need it and that's why i was a bit disappointed listening to wale do um not having any idea that that is urgent enough that can you know make things work you know everything i heard was just platitudes and uh you know um regrets and all of that you know things that just did not add up so you need people who can articulate. You need people who, who can articulate a new direction of where this economy needs to get to urgently. Now, the average Nigeria needs food on the table now. That's what NLC is talking about. And it's, uh, NLC is representing millions of workers. That's what they are talking about. Their members can feed. You watch videos every day of people who are saying, oh, we can't we can go to the market again because yeah. a lot of things are very expensive. Transportation is so super expensive. And the government has made a lot of promises that it has yet to keep. It's one year. How long will it take for you to start making things move? You've talked about CNG. You want to turn buses into CNG to reduce the uh, um, cost of uh, transport or whatever and all that. Why are you still talking? Why aren't you working already? Why aren't you doing stuff? Why aren't you, why aren't you seeing those buses on the road already? That's what we need to see. But Frank, uh, Frank just a moment, just a moment. Um, the federal government has come out to say to boost manufacturing and so many other things, make the place conducive for, uh, for uh, producers or manufacturers. They're going to float a, a loan scheme, sort of, that will have one digit, that is 9%, 9 yes. uh, instead of the approved 26 point something percent that the CBN is talking about, the federal government is offering loans for 9%. Do you think that will be a booster to the production, of, uh, production level in our country? It, it, the challenge I have with all of, all of those things is that they are still at the talking level. I don't know why they are talking. In in January first, on January first, when the when, when the president made his uh, um, national Speech, address, yeah. one of the things that he said was that um, about two hundred billion naira will be released um, that will be assessed by uh, small businesses and also manufacturers. You know, and that was also about um, a loan. As that, as that last week, one of the things that we reported was that the businesses that were supposed to be ass assessing those loans ha are yet to do those, uh, are yet to do that. The question is, if you have released that money, why are you putting barriers? Why are you putting bottlenecks um, for these businesses to actually assess those loans? At least by now, we should be hearing that at least 600 businesses have gotten the loans. And... You know, there, there needs to be. Uh, I don't. They don't understand. As in, I don't see the urgency of uh, the country is on fire. You need 
to quench the fire. That's what we're talking about. If you're coming to give us single digits loans and all that, I'm not, I am not interested about what you're saying. I'm interested in what, about what you are doing concerning that. Or what are you make, doing to make it happen? It needs to have happened yesterday. So if you're still talking about it now, it means that you have not even started to make it happen. When you're going to talk to us, I want to see that the, the, the collaborators that are going to make this happen, who are the banks that you're going to give the money to? I want to see them on the table when they're talking about it. I want to see what they are saying about where, how people can assess it, how easy it is. I also want to see the technology that's built in it because when you make it manual, it becomes a matter of people have to go through somebody to get to the loans. And at the end of the day, monies are filtered out where they're not supposed to go to. So it needs to be te um, technology driven. And if it's not technology driven, then um, the, the chances of it succeeding becomes a problem. So that's where we, there has to be this urgency. It's not about talking about this. It? Yeah, it's a good thing. We can, we can stay here debate it and say it's a good thing or not a good thing and all of that. And three, four, four, years, four years down the line, that thing has not been implemented. Mm. It's a matter of, well, have you started it? That's what I want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. And how, how far has it gone? Mm -hmm. That's what the average general wants to see right now. I, I mean, I totally agree with you because um, it's you walking the walk and not just talking. Um, but the president has said something. He has said that he's working um, to ensure that, you know, lives of Nigerians are better. He's working to improve the lives of Nigerians. However, the um, leader of the NLC has said, in, in fact, it's on The Guardian, on The Vanguard this morning, and says government reforms shouldn't push Nigerians to poverty. So now, um, Mr. Estelle, all of these things that's happening today, all of the reforms that the government have been trying to do, both positive and maybe counterproductive, um, started from the president's first day in office. The moment he assumed office, he made just one statement that, you know, just had a ripple effect on everything. And that statement was subsidy is gone. Now, where we are today, thinking of how much people have to spend on transportation, which you said takes over 60 percent, um, you know, of their salary and even other things that they have to do. Because if you go to the market, when you want to buy goods, the seller will tell you, oh, I had to transport it from the um, from the farmer. To, the farmer had to sell it to me and we had to transport it here to the market. So you see transportation you know cuts across every sector and even for people who have to service their businesses they probably have to still use this product to provide an alternative power um for themselves so do you think that statement that the president made on um the 29th of may 2023 saying subsidy is gone do you think it was a good call or a bad call i will not want to say whether it's good or bad but the fact is that it's policy so if you if you make a policy you also need to put measures in place to mitigate whatever uh, effect of that policy. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'm a, I'm a very handsome person and I also like to, to talk from experience. I just don't like the, uh, theory. Theory is okay, but you have to have an on-the-spot assessment. I'll, I'll give an example of, of myself. I will not say I'm not, I'm not a mass. And I will also say I'm grateful. I'm, I'm also privileged. Now, my wife, would always come every month and then we're looking at cost of running the home and every day every month the thing is increasing by the day so one day she decided that we have domestic staff that gets that goes that goes shopping for us and then one day she said i know this thing is just getting out of hand I, am i sure that these people are not making some under the table deals so let me go and see this thing for myself so she went to the market and did all the shopping for herself and when she came back I actually had to be petting her because she was <laughs> complaining all the through the night that that she would never go to the market again, and that and then she was itemizing the cost of things in the market, Aww. and that these domestic staff who are doing this shopping are actually trying, and then she cannot imagine why she will pay X Y Z, and I'm now pleading with her, please just forget about it, <laughs> don't ever go again. Now, that is somebody. That is somebody who is privileged. Mm -hmm. I, I I think I, I worked in one of the best places to work in this country, and then she is still in that sector. So we are very we are we are okay as in court. And then you can imagine how we are complaining. So mm -hmm. now imagine somebody who is earning who is only fifty thousand, sixty thousand, and she she came to me and said she doesn't even know how these people are surviving. 
So that is what you see the NNC is talking about. That is what you see the TUC is talking about. The, the economist said something on the phone, which I will take you back. When government wants to pursue a policy in a certain climate, they identify industries, manufacturers that can help drive that policy and put the who the, make the fund available for them to run. Government don't need to interfere in their day-to-day -day, uh, activity. But what they do in Nigeria is that those politicians want to be part of it because they mm. want to benefit directly. Yeah. Whether it comes straight to their pocket or it comes to family members. I'll give you an example of Tesla. The American government was forward-looking and decided that, okay, we want to reduce, uh, we want to improve the climate. We want, we want to reduce climate pollution. Okay, now let's encourage uh, investment in electric cars. So they went to Tesla. Tesla, what would, what do you want to ramp up your production? And you will not believe it. Elon Musk is the richest man in the world. Tesla has this money at that time. And the American government gave Tesla up to $4 billion grant. Tesla is going to pay back. Yes. That payback, the, the grant is in is, is such a way that the company will ramp up production and it will be stress free, sometimes at a zero interest. That is how they do they do what they do in other parts of the world. If you decided IT is an area where you want to concentrate on, Nigeria right now is supposed to be to be a, a, an IT shop. Just encourage all the young boys, you want to go to university, this is what we want you to study. This is how we want Nigeria to be. Indians did it. The, the, the poverty capital of the world used to be India. First mm. time it used to be China. Yeah. What did they do? They had a concentrated effort. They were intentional that we're going to move our people out of poverty. And over a period of time, China is the second largest economy in the world. And in the next 10 years, India is going to be there because they are knocking at the door seriously. India has gone to, to the moon. So these are the things that we say government should do. Policies that not just workers are not NSTUC, I will tell you they are not fixated on four hundred and ninety four thousand. I'm happy when you read when you broke it down. Yeah. You also agree that it depends upon where you are living. You can't live in a self contained apartment on the island and you say you are you can't pay anything less than eight hundred thousand. That's also depending upon the area you are also going to stay. Sango Tedo Moe. If, but all those areas are where you can get it to 800,000. If you are staying in Lekki Axis and towards Chevron, you are not going to spend any less than a million for a self contained apartment. So okay, okay, Let, let's decision. cut it short, Mr. So, uh, Mr. Estelle. Let's cut it short because uh, we're running out of time. And, and I'm sure we're going to ask both of you the same question. Uh, if you were to advise government, what would you say the minimum wage, wage should be and why? I'm not going to give it, put a figure because no figure <laughs> we are careful. going to put right now that it will be enough. But the fact mm. is, government go to the basics and deal with those things that affect workers. You can pay one million naira without paying one million naira cash by doing the heavy lifting that is around the workers. Mm. Mm. Sure. Yes, I agree with uh, Mr. Peter. I, I I think that it is not about the amount that you put on there. If you even if you pay them hundred thousand and then um, they keep paying for electricity, that is. Uh, a, a, um, very high. They keep um, there's no access um, to wherever they're going to work or something, you know. So they're going to um, that money is going to leave them within two weeks, you know. Uh, I'm going into the week. I think what's for me important is that the optics have to be right. Um, the government needs to show some sense of we are in it with you, mm. you know. Mm. The things that we hear. Um, the government squander monies on um, are not right. There is no way you hear those kind of things and then you not think, oh, these guys are insane. You know, things like a 90 billion naira given to people to go on the pilgrimage, 170 million for SUVs and all of that. And then you're going abroad, you're carrying a, an entourage of over a thousand people, you know, and you're still living as if Nigeria is the second um, largest economy in the world um, when things are not the way it is. So the, it, the optics needs to be right. If the optics are right, the government is showing like, look, we too are in the both with you. We are going to also cut our own expenses. We're going to cut the way we live our lives. 
and they don't go uh, go on um, recruiting aid here and there. The government, um, the president, even have a, an an aid for teleprompter. Um, uh, uh, you know, so very ridiculous things that you hear. Mm. So the optics needs to be addressed. Yeah. Live according to what the economy is saying. Mm. That's what people need to see. So whatever you put on the table, um, the NLC can look at it and say, yeah, we see the sacrifice that you two you are making. Oh yeah, we'll come. Um, we'll we'll come meet you at this certain level, and then you go ahead and do the, and take the monies that you have borrowed and use them for what they are supposed to be used for. Mm. If it's for infrastructure, put the infrastructure there. Mm. Let's not hear stories about that. All right. Um, I think at the end of the day, everyone wants, wants what's best for Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the NLC and TUC, the fight that they're fighting right now is just for the common man in Nigeria. And we hope that the government, you know, understands this. And whatever agreement you're trying to have with them, you know, um, shows that they are in with us. They are in this boat, according to Frank. They're in the boat with us, holding our hands and saying, you know, we can all do it together. And we're looking forward to um, a more prosperous Nigeria. Nigeria. Gentlemen, we want to say thank you for coming. Peter and Frank, thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely having a conversation with mm. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. All right, we've been speaking with Peter Estelle, who's a former TUC and Pengasan president, and we're also, uh, we're also speaking with Frank Elianya, who's an economic analyst and also a company analyst at TechCabal. And we've just been talking about um, the impact on the minimum wage and what um, the NLC and TUC have been fighting for, which is a better agreement with um, you know, the federal government. This is where we have to wrap it up on the show today. Thank you for having a breakfast with us. As always, my name is Rome Paulson. Today will just serve as marriage counselors between federal government <laughs> and NLC TUC. Yeah, go! Please, please just settle the issues so that there will be no problem. You know, tomorrow okay. we need we need to come and be smiling that uh, yeah. Nigeria is better. Mm -hmm. Let's do it again tomorrow. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Have an amazing day. Mm -hmm.